ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, it's an enormous pleasure to be able to thank Hans and Gulchin uh, for their very uh, generous hospitality. Um, <coughs> And I'd also like to thank uh, Leila and, uh, and uh, Jay, who uh, contribute uh, very much to this conference, and also to the uh, hotel uh, staff, uh, not least the uh, kitchen staff, who helped to uh, make this uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most agreeable conferences anywhere. Um, now, uh, my subject uh, this year is a murderer as I've known, so that's the end of Mr. Nice Guy. Um, and uh, this is not a subject which is uh, of great interest to most of you from the point of view of economics. So not long ago, I was asked to review a book by a psychiatrist who claimed that in the United States, the murder rate uh, rose during Republican uh, presidencies and declined during Democratic ones. In order to produce this conclusion, there was quite a lot of statistical uh, manipulation. Uh, and he attributed this to the differences in the levels of uh, redistribution under the uh, various presidencies. Um, and, of course, like everyone else, he assumed that uh, uh, correlation was causation. And the second economic law, the only one that I've discovered about murder, is that when uh, someone murders for life insurance, it's always within two weeks of the sum assured having been increased by at least a thousand percent. Um, well, uh, first I want to ask you uh, whether there's anyone in this room who uh, is uninterested in murder, who finds uh, murder a dull and boring subject. And I'm asking in general, I'm not asking anything about uh, any murders in particular you may have in mind. Uh, now, there's no one, uh, no one's put his hand up. Um, and I think it's a rather curious phenomenon, actually, that everyone is interested in murder. And I'm not sure I can fully explain it. And uh, certainly literature would be much the poorer uh, without uh, murder. Uh, Shakespeare alone would de be depleted of uh, most of his greatest plays. There wouldn't be Hamlet, Othello, Richard II, Richard III, Julius Caesar, Coriolanus, and many others. Uh, and in fact, if you think about Macbeth, what would Macbeth be without murder? I mean, Macbeth would have to apply to be uh, King of Scotland. <laughs> He'd send in his CV. And uh, the, uh, the appointment committee, in which, of course, there would be the three witches, uh, might give him a temporary uh, contract until um, Banquo's son uh, graduated from the university and was fit to take over permanently. So I think you can see that without murder, Macbeth would be a lot less interesting. Now, some of you might ask, why think of individual murders at all? when there are so many mass killings, both in history and at the present moment. And uh, I hesitate to mention such an authority, but Joseph Stalin was definitely onto something when he said that a single death is a tragedy uh, and a million deaths is a statistic. Uh, and it comes naturally to us to think in small terms rather than large ones. Our interest is captured much more by the burglary next door than the famine several thousand miles away, uh, even though we admit that in the abstract, the famine is more important than the burglary. Well, in my career as a doctor, I can't say it's been my good fortune or my pleasure, but certainly it's been a matter of interest uh, to meet a very considerable number of murderers. Um, and of course, I can't des describe more than uh, one or two of them. Um, but if you're waiting, I hope you're not waiting to hear from me anything that illuminates anything in a, a, a general uh, fashion, because I have no theory to propound. Uh, this is pure salaciousness and, um, and prurience and sensationalism. And uh, really, the main lesson from my 
uh, contact with murderers is that I've learned nothing from them. <laughs> Now, part of the reason for that, of course, is we put all murderers into a single category, the fact that they're murderers, uh, but they do differ very considerably. There's no single type, the murderer. Uh, one thing I did learn, though this can hardly be called a uh, lesson, is that while we generally think of murder as the worst crime, uh, murderers are not the worst criminals, not necessarily the worst criminals. Indeed, inside prison, they generally enjoy a certain prestige, uh, so long as it is not a child that they have killed, and so long as sex was not in, uh, involved in the uh, murder, because that puts them beyond the pale. In general, if it's just uh, what I might call, uh, and what policemen in England call, an ordinary domestic murder, um, a man accused uh, of cruelty to a dog can expect uh, more disapprobation from other prisoners than a murderer. And perhaps this is because most prisoners can envisage wanting to kill someone, but they can't envisage uh, wanting to harm a dog. Well, I remember uh, meeting what I hope you will not mind me calling uh, my first murderer uh, when I was a very young doctor. I thought then that he was a very old man, he was in his 50s, and, uh, <coughs> and he'd uh, strangled his wife after many years of marriage. And I remember feeling uh, distinctly honoured uh, to meet so unusual a man and to shake his hand. Um, after all, murderers in those days were uh, fewer than members of parliament and, I suppose, a lot more interesting. Um, well, the murderer had been sent to prison, because, uh, to hospital, uh, because his crime was statistically very unusual and it was thought that he might be suffering from some kind of medical condition that could possibly explain it. And here I should uh, perhaps tell you that common crime, um, violent crime and uh, burglary, for example, property crime, is a young man's game. Very few criminals start their criminal career as this man did in his 50s. And when I examined the statistics for the age at which people are sent to prison in Britain, I found that about 98% of them are under the age of 39. Uh, when they are sent to prison. In other words, criminality uh, of the common kind uh, remits, if you like, uh, spontaneously after the age of 39, even among people who have committed many, many crimes. And this fact has suggested to many commentators that there's a biological determination of criminality, though I think this is uh, mistaken as a, as a major theory of, of crime uh, because uh, that cannot really explain the enormous fluctuations in the rate of crime in any given society. And at most, uh, biological or medical factors influence criminality and in a few individual cases may explain it, but that's all. Anyway, be that as it may, uh, my first uh, murderer was sent to the hospital to be examined and uh, after extensive investigation, uh, nothing was found uh, uh, that would uh, supply a medical uh, explanation of his action, which was incidentally completely out of character. Um, well, he explained it himself to me. I remember this very well. He, he said that uh, after, uh, uh, for many years he'd come home from work and he was tired and he wanted peace and quiet. He, on his way home, he always bought the evening newspaper. And what he wanted was to sit in his armchair and read it. His wife, however, had been at home all day and had seen no one. And this, uh, so he, she was waiting for him to talk to him. And uh, this, of course, for many years, had interfered with his reading of the newspaper. <laughs> and unbeknown to her, uh, this frustrated him enormously. And um, unfortunately, his wife uh, wore little golden drop earrings with uh, 
uh, in the form of a cross, and they jiggled as she spoke. <laughs> And he said, uh, I just couldn't stand it anymore, doctor. <laughs> then the earrings. <laughs> they kept on jiggling. And so they drove him to a fury one day, and he strangled her. Uh, needless to say, this was not regarded as an adequate legal excuse <laughs> for his action. And uh, he was a man of uh, limited imagination, and it had not occurred to him to ask his wife to wear other types of earrings. <laughs> well, the law in England in most countries uh, recognizes uh, provocation, but in order that it should not become an excuse in advance for killing, it's a rather narrow definition, and perhaps it's psychologically um, not real, very realistic. At any rate, uh, I remember one day the police brought a, a young Ghanaian man covered in human blood. He was still covered in the blood of the person he'd killed, um, an illegal immigrant to my office in the hospital, and he just stabbed his girlfriend to death. And the police wanted to know uh, whether he was uh, fit to be interviewed. And I had a medical student with me, and like ma most medical students at that stage of his development, he was rather naive and uh, had no contact with any kind of story that he was about to hear. Well, the young Ghanaian was a very nice young man, actually, not at all the kind of man that you would expect to kill. And as soon as he had arrived in the country, he'd managed, with some difficulty, to find a job for himself and somewhere to live. And, and neither of these things, of course, is easy for, uh, for an illegal immigrant. And then he met a girl uh, from the city in which I was working who casually invited him to come and live with her. And they were lovers uh, before long, but she tired of him. And she used to provoke him by telephoning another lover, former lover of hers, in front of him and asking him to come and make love to her as he, the Ghanaian, uh, was not nearly as good a lover. And on the morning of her death, she told him to leave the flat immediately because she was fed up with him, she was tired of him. Now he had nowhere to go, he begged her, he had no job now, uh, he begged her to allow her to stay until he had found somewhere to live, somewhere to go. In other words, she was just proposing to put him out on the street. But she refused and started throwing his few belongings out, of the, out onto the street. And he was desperate, but she laughed at him and she insisted. And he thought that she was playing with him and, and the humiliation was terrible. And he took a knife and stabbed her. And the medical student was uh, very shaken by what he heard. And I, th I think he saw in that one instance the possible depths of human humiliation and despair and what it can actually sometimes lead to. Well, in the, uh, case, another case involving an Ill illegal immigrant, this time Chinese, I, I appeared in the court uh, for the defense. He spoke not a word of English, and he had arrived in, in our city from somewhere else where he had some minor difficulties. I, I, don't, I don't know what they were exactly, but he had some minor difficulties. And in the streets of our city, he met a, a young Chinese uh, student, and they started talking. He said he had nowhere to live, and out of some kind of national solidarity, the student who had a spare room, he, he lived with his wife, came, uh, invited him to come and and uh, live with him because he had nowhere to go. Unfortunately, he was mad and suffering from a paranoid psychosis. He thought that people were talking about him in a menacing manner. And, and this is, of course, a very easy thing to think when, you, when you're walking, when you're slightly mad anyway, and when you're walking around in a place where you understand not a word of the language. 
Uh, and he eventually came to believe that his benefactor was plotting to kill him because he heard hallucinatory voices that told him so. And early one morning, uh, not very long after his arrival in the benefactor's flat, he ran out into the street. He stopped a passing uh, police car to tell the police that his landlord was trying to kill him. But of course, he didn't speak any English, and the um, police didn't speak any Chinese, so they couldn't make out what he was saying, and uh, they just drove on. He returned to the flat where a short time later, he stabbed his uh, landlord dead in front of his wife. Well, I met him in prison, and through interpreters and his Chinese-speaking lawyer, it became clear to me that he was mad, and I gave him some treatment, and to my surprise, within, within two weeks, he became completely normal. And he was actually a, a pleasant young man of peasant origin who probably had been sent by his family uh, who had to save money for him to come to earn some money. Um, and once he was better, he started to work in the prison and he gave us no trouble at all. And he was that fabled figure, the model prisoner. But his case gave us an interesting insight into the summary nature of uh, current Chinese justice. Uh, shortly after he'd recovered, he appeared in court uh, for a preliminary hearing. And it was all over very quickly. He was just remanded back into to prison. Um, and the, the whole hearing lasted only a few minutes at the most. And as he left the dock, uh, he took off his shirt and uh, we, he was asked why he was doing that. And his reply was very revealing. He said, well, you're going to take me around the corner and shoot me. Mm. So that is a, a revealing insight into uh, uh, the nature of uh, current Chinese um, uh, justice, at least amongst uh, his class. No doubt some of you read uh, detective novels and may even be aficionados of the golden age of English uh, crime novels, people like Agatha Christie or uh, uh, Dorothy Sayers. Incidentally, it's always said that Agatha Christie has sold more books than any other author uh, other than the Bible, whose author, authorship I won't go into. Um, <laughs> Now, these uh, crime novels are, are very reassuring, and they're more for fairy stories, of course, than social realism. The murders, which are never uh, described in gruesome detail, the kind of gruesome detail that nowadays is extremely fashionable and that is uh, supposed to make us face up to reality, but in my view is just salaciousness and prurience. Um, the murders in Agatha Christie take place in uh, circumstances and locations where murders are least likely ever to occur, such as the libraries of great country houses. And uh, in the end, everything is restored, peace, tranquility, justice is done, and all the rest of it, and all is right once more with the world. And if you can call a murder cosy, uh, these are nice, cosy murders. Well, I don't suppose I need to tell you that most murders are not very cosy, and they are sordid in the extreme and are not done with any cunning or refinement. This has been, of course, a complaint uh, in British writing for a very long time, in about 1820. De Quincey wrote uh, a famous essay called um, Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts. And uh, uh, George Orwell wrote about the decline of the English murder. Um, but they're very sordid. And they usually occur at the heat of a moment in, in the, uh, after a sordid, foolish, trivial qu uh, quarrel, often drunken, and uh, require no detective skills uh, to solve. But they do tell us quite a lot about the lower depths of our society. I was once asked to examine a 17-year-old girl who had stabbed her 15-year-old lesbian lover uh, to death. And when I went to the prison in which, I, uh, in which he was being held, 
I expected to find a very unpleasant, aggressive, and possibly rather stupid young woman whom I thought I would detest. But on the contrary, I found a decent person, and I came away feeling very sorrowful. Uh, and it's a sorrow that I can recapture when I think about the case. She was born of a white mother and a Jamaican father who, in what I'm afraid has now become almost a normal fashion, abandoned them both uh, soon after her birth. And her mother then took up with a Jamaican cocaine dealer who was violent towards her and was always in and out of prison. And she herself uh, was an alcoholic who uh, took uh, drugs. And uh, she would repeatedly throw the uh, cocaine dealer out of the house, but she would always allow him back in again. Uh, and, and he was violent towards her again, but she was always uh, in some kind of drunken or drug-induced stupor. In the meantime, uh, she did not notice that her son, who was a few years older than her daughter, was having full intercourse with her uh, between, the age, between the age of nine and, or 10 and 14. This was the daughter. Well, when her daughter told her about it when she was about 14, she did what most mothers do in this situation, um, at least in my experience of cases like this, and that is to say she called the daughter a lying slut and threw her out onto the street. Uh, and there she was uh, obliged to go to the social services who put her in a children's home. Having reached the age of personal autonomy, which is uh, 16, the social services found her a flat of her own and gave her some, some money to live in it. And there she started to live with a 15-year-old girl from not very different circumstances. And they spent most of the money on alcohol and cannabis. And one day in the course of a drug, an alcohol-fueled quarrel, uh, she chased her lover from the flat with two carving knives. And everything in England is now videoed, so you see her running through the flats uh, with two uh, carving knives like this, uh, like a kind of a mad operatic uh, murderess. And she caught up with her lover and stabbed her to death. Now, in English law, quite rightly, in my opinion, intoxication is not an excuse or even a mitigation, uh, so long as the intoxication is voluntary, uh, which it always is. And therefore, uh, this young uh, girl or uh, woman was found guilty of murder. But when I examined her, I found her to be a very nice young woman, uh, remorseful, and her behavior in the prison had been very, very good. And indeed, and this is startling to me, she said she was happier in prison than anywhere she had ever been in her life. Because for the first time, uh, she was treated with reasonable consistency and also, strangely, with some kind of respect. And anyone who has been to a women's prison in Britain will understand what light this throws on her previous light, life. And I had little doubt that she would do very well in prison, and she would receive an education that would fit her for a decent life afterwards. And it says something about uh, contemporary Britain, that uh, not only would she receive an education in prison, but it was the only place she would receive an education. Well, just before I left her, I asked her whether she had any questions to ask me, because I'd asked her a lot of questions, of course. And she said, will they be nasty to me in court? And this is a question whose innocence and unworldliness was completely at variance with her previous uh, conduct. And she'd been really a child forced by circumstances to live without guidance in a completely pitiless and psychopathic world. Um, well, out of the mouths of murderers sometimes come the most astonishing uh, statements. And I apologize if I've mentioned this before. Um, I'm reaching the age of repetition. But um, 
Um, one murderer said to me just after he had killed his girlfriend, I had to kill her doctor or I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> and here we see the uh, reductio ad absurdum of the idea that unexpressed or unacted upon desires or emotions lead to real harm, unlike murder. Um, as William Blake put it, sooner strangle an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. And one of the things that murder, and I, I'm sure I've spoken about this before to this meeting, one of the things that the uh, murderers used to say, people who had stabbed someone to death used to say, which made me think about a lot of things, was uh, when they described what happened, they always said the knife went in, <laughs> almost always, which meant that, of course, the knife was the active a partner in the transaction. And when you think about it, this is how people often present their lives when they have, when they think there are advantages uh, to doing so. They know that it's not true, but with repetition it becomes true in their minds. Another murderer asked to describe himself after he had killed, uh, decapitated and dismembered his best friend uh, for bizarre sexual practices, which I will not describe, uh, said after some reflection to describe himself, he said, well, I'm, I'm laid back, he said, and fun to be with. <laughs> One of the last murderers, uh, murders in which I was involved as an expert witness, I hasten to add, um, was that of an old alcoholic who was visited by four other alcoholics. They spend their whole life together. Uh, and they, they, the, the four alcoholics uh, claimed that the old alcoholic owed them uh, 20 pounds, that's about $30, which in these... Um, uh, circumstances is a lot of money uh, because it allows you to be drunk uh, for quite a long time. Uh, they drink uh, uh, a kind of cider which is 9% um, alcohol and has obviously never seen an apple or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, you can be drunk on it uh, very, very cheaply. Well, in an attempt to extract this money from him, uh, they tied him to his armchair and uh, tortured him for two hours. Uh, they banged his legs with hammers, they stabbed him, and they poured boiling water over him. And uh, they treated him, as I said, for, for in this fashion for about two hours, and they, then they left when they were convinced that he didn't, in fact, have 20 pounds. Um, <clears throat> uh, and he was still alive when they left, but he died shortly afterwards. And I, I was asked to um, examine one of the culprits, the presumed culprits, uh, and uh, a woman who said that uh, uh, she didn't do it, she only watched. Um, well, as part of my examination, I had to test her memory, and one of the things you do is ask whether people couldn't remember what was in the news. And it so happened that the day before, uh, there had been a story about a woman, a rather aggressive and extremely nasty woman, who had uh, viciously stabbed, had been found guilty of viciously stabbing uh, three men uh, to death. And, uh, and she remembered that. She said that, you know, and there, there were those women, she said, who killed three men. And then she said, uh, very memorably, I don't know what this world is coming to. <laughs> man's uh, curious ability to fail to make the most <coughs> obvious connections um, was also obvious to me um, uh, when I met a, uh, perhaps the most notorious murder, murderer I, uh, I met, um, but this time not in England but in Liberia. It was during the Civil War there and uh, the name of the murderer was Brigadier General Field Marshal Prince Y. Johnson. And I went to interview him 
in the morning because it was said to be very dangerous to uh, interview him afterwards uh, because he took a lot of cannabis and he took a lot of drink and um, he went around shooting people. And he was the man who captured the former president of Liberia, Samuel Doe, during the war. And, um, and I had seen the video of Johnson, beer in hand, interrogating uh, Doe, who was trussed up like a chicken, naked in front of him. And Johnson was very proud of this interview. Uh, it showed him trying to extract from Doe the numbers of his bank accounts in London. Doe denied any such numbers, saying, Prince, I don't have uh, any accounts. After being asked uh, once or twice again, Johnson orders one of his, the people around him to cut off Doe's ears, which he does. And uh, the, the torture continues until Doe uh, dies of exsanguination. And um, uh, Johnson, of course, killed many, many people, personally. Didn't just order people to kill others. I asked uh, Johnson what his ambition was. I, I, well, first, I, we started, we were talking about democracy first. And <laughs> And bringing uh, freedom and democracy to Liberia. And uh, then I asked him, then he said, well, I'm not ambitious myself. And I said, well, what did, what's your ambition? And he said he wanted to be a pastor of a uh, church. And sure enough, that is exactly what he became in neighboring Nigeria. However, once the Civil War was over, uh, he returned to Liberia, where he is now a li uh, senator of the Liberian Senate and uh, was a presidential candidate. Um, I'm often asked who was the worst person I, 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 I've ever met. I mean, uh, people of all times always ask me, or well not, not always, but often ask me, who was the worst person I ever met. And it's quite interesting, because no one's ever asked me who's the best person I've ever met. <laughs> which suggests that evil has a, uh, an attraction which uh, virtue does not have. And, um, and I, of course, it's very difficult to say whether to distinguish between, for example, a man who impaled three children while he was their babysitter because they were interrupting his uh, viewing of the television, or a man and his wife who um, uh, abducted young women and raped and tortured them to death. Uh, they did so, incidentally, also to their own children, and um, and um, and buried them in their house. Well, uh, I think that's enough uh, prurience and salaciousness for you. Um, and although what I've said uh, has no real lesson to be learned. I mean, there's nothing to learn from all this, I suppose. Um, I can't help recalling Alexander Pope's lines in the essay, on his essay on man. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. But I adapt it slightly. Know then thyself, seek no further. The proper study of mankind is murder. <laughs> Thank you very much.